say some preliminary words and then we uh, I will give you a floor okay So good, good uh, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are happy to continue uh, the um, uh, school for young scientists, which is organized by Moscow State University in collaboration with a few other organizers. And uh, today. Uh, we have the lecture uh, of, uh, we'll start with the lecture of Professor Salomon Cronenberg, who is um, uh, from Netherlands, uh, and he's uh, in Rio since 29, and also he is the honorary professor of Moscow State University, who is the host of this event. And uh, uh, so uh, Professor Cronenberg is very big friend of our department and of our faculty, and I'm happy to, we are happy to have this lecture today. And so, Chris Cronenberg, uh, you have for up to one hour with the questions, so with your lecture, uh, very welcome. Thank you that you accepted our invitation. Thank you very much. So, shall I start? You can start, yes. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can see me, okay. Um, my talk will be about a very big river called Eridanos. And what you see here is a map of Western Europe. And I would challenge you to, to find this river Eridanos. Uh, you see a lot of rivers in Western Europe. You may see the Rhine, you may see the start of the Danube and the rivers of the Thames and so on. But where is Eridanos River? Well, in fact, it's no longer there. Uh, I will be speaking about a river which has already died. And we are speaking in time scales which are a bit larger than most of the talks in this conference. I'm very happy to be invited. Let me see that uh, I say that from the beginning by uh, Dr. Chalov and uh, Professor Kasimov, an old friend of all of, of 30 years. Uh, but uh, we sometimes, I am a geographer by training, but also a geologist uh, by the PhD. So I'm a little bit joining those both, uh, uh, both uh, specializations. And therefore I take the liberty to speak about uh, river systems uh, and their history in, in millions of years. So much uh, larger timescales than the, more, the other lectures that you will see. But still it's, it's important and so on. So, so where is this Eridanos River? You don't see it here, but you will see it in the next slide. There it is. And you might be uh, afraid that, uh, well, and say that this is, this is Baltic Sea, this is not a river. Uh, but if you think a little bit more, then you see, well, it's in, in fact, uh, uh, this Baltic uh, uh, Gulf and the Gulf of Finland and so, they really have uh, the shape of a river basin. Only there's no river there, it's, it's, it's a sea. And uh, so uh, this river is, is almost as big as the Amazon River. And this river has disappeared one and a half million years ago. It started to form about three and a half million years ago. It was about, uh, about uh, two million years it has existed in the, in, in the way and then it, it disappeared. It has made a big delta in the, in, in the North Sea. And you would say, so how do you know? So that is what we are going to look for first. Uh, how do we actually know that this river was there? Uh, and, and one of the important things to remember is this name Eridanos is a, is a name which was invented by uh, uh, Hesiodus. It's a Greek writer in the seventh century before the common era. Uh, and he uh, made in his uh, Theogonia a list of all the rivers that were existing at that time. And he called also Eridanos. And Eridanos in classical antiquity was also the river that uh, brought amber uh, and amber, yantar, uh, that is something uh, that uh, was known already in, in antiquity. And they say this is a product of River Eridanos. And we will see part of the story why it is called uh, the Amber River and uh, how it has been developed uh, through time. 
Uh, so this is actually the shape of the river and we will try to see its, uh, its history in, in the coming slides. And I will also speak a little bit about the future. So that's uh, maybe interesting. Uh, so what happens uh, in, the, in the future with uh, this uh, strange river, uh, which is about 2000 kilometers long, much longer than any Western European uh, river, maybe not as long as, uh, as Volga or more or less in the same style, but still it was uh, actually something like the Amazon of Western Europe until it somehow died. We will see how it died. Well, this is an, an artist's view uh, made for a movie in, in the Netherlands. Uh, where they made the, uh, some kind of a, an image of how the river might have flowed when still uh, the river basin was intact and so from uh, Finland here and uh, the, the Bosnian Gulf and so on right to Denmark and this is the delta which I already spoke about uh, and to the right uh, you see uh, the scientists view uh, they, you see how uh, I have to minimize this so otherwise you can't see it. Uh, here is Finland. This is uh, the first uh, uh, trace of the river in uh, cr across southern Sweden, but then you get uplift of the southern Sweden, Swedish dome, and then it sh shifted further south, according to the analysis of Karna uh, Lidmar Bergström from Sweden, who has dedicated whole, dedicated whole her life on the geomorphology of uh, of Sweden. So uh, you see, uh, uh, it is not only a, a concept by fantasy or by uh, people from antiquity, it is a serious subject which has been studied by many, many scientists in, in many places. And also, of course, from uh, Russian scientists from St. Petersburg and uh, Kaliningrad. And so we know also from uh, uh, that a lot of work has been done in the uh, Kaliningrad area by the Moscow State University people. Uh, Katja Bajukova, for instance, has been working there quite a lot. So if we look at, uh, at the, the, the geological structure of the area in which we find uh, the, the southern part of this uh, pathway of the Eridanos River, we come into the North Sea. And in the North Sea, uh, there is a, it's a big sedimentary basin with sediments which are uh, almost uh, three, three and a half kilometers deep. Uh, from the sea bottom, the sea bottom is only 40 to 80 meters, so it's, it's a huge sedimentary basin and it has received sediment from the Eridanos River. You cannot see that uh, here, but uh, I will show you how it has been discovered. Because the North Sea, as you know, is an area where a lot of oil and gas is being produced at present, and so those three and a half kilometers of, uh, of sediments have been uh, studied in very great detail using, using seismic exploration. And seismic exploration, uh, this is the research vessel. Uh, they make a, an explosion uh, by uh, sending an air bubble, a, a huge air bubble in the sea. And when this air bubble implodes, then you get uh, sound waves and the sound waves uh, touch the sea bottom, but also uh, discontinuities in the sedimentary package and they are being returned reflected to the hydrophones in the uh, behind the ship and uh, all those data they give an, an image of what is happening uh, below the sea surface and uh, how to find oil and gas in the uh, in the north sea which you cannot see so this is the, the best way to have an idea what is uh, present below the sea surface uh, here you see sandstone and claystone. The sandstone uh, water is first, and then comes oil, and then comes gas. What's lighter is further higher up. And the clay, claystone makes sure uh, that the oil doesn't escape to the surface. So that's the way in the which they find oil and gas deposits uh, under the water, and uh, which is very common everywhere in the world. So they have done this also in the North Sea. Uh, you see all those black lines that are seismic lines where the ships have been making this kind of, uh, of surveys, uh, seismic surveys. These are drill holes, which you see there, the black squares with the uh, red contours. And uh, these are detailed seismic questions. This work has been analyzed by a PhD student of mine, Irina Overeem, who, by the way, also published on Volga Delta. And on the Danish part, they have also made quite a lot of different uh, seismic, uh, uh, seismic data. And uh, the, when Irena was uh, analyzing, she is a Dutch, Dutch scientist. Uh, she's called Irina, but apparently because the, her parents liked that name, she has no Russian ancestry as far as I know. Uh, 
but she has been working together with uh, Christine Bishop Cray, that is a PhD from uh, from Britain, and they have to, to, together made a, a very important discoveries on uh, what is exactly to be seen in this area of the North Sea. Uh, and the, Mr. Hughes in, the, in the Denmark, more or less the same, but they have a much smaller part of the North Sea, of course. So those uh, seismic images that you can make, you can make vertical. You will see a few, a few vertical seismic slices in, uh, in the next slides, but you can also make horizontal slides. They call it time slides. And I uh, showed at first, because what you see here, uh, that is the course of a river. Uh, a, a river, say about one and a half kilometers or two kilometers deep in the uh, sediments of the, uh, of the north of the North Sea, so it is not at the surface; it is deep, and it is by a combination of uh, of different uh, uh, seismic profiles that you can see it. And it's just a meandering river, like the one you have been studying in in Sachino and uh, and uh, wherever in the Volga in the, in Moscow State University. You see an oxbow lake here, uh, a crevasses play when the, where the the levees have been breached, and uh, there is a uh, sediment being deposited in the floodplain beyond the river course. And so here's another crevasses play. Uh, so actually uh, the seismic data, they immediately give you an image of uh, what kind of sediments there were. And there were apparently fluvial sediments, sediments deposited by rivers. And uh, this is a part of the Delta here. You cannot yet see that it's a Delta. And now we will see a few vertical sections and that's also very interesting. That's typically the way in which uh, such seismic sections are being represented. Uh, all those uh, red and black, uh, red and blue lines, they are the reflectors, uh, the, the, the places where the sound waves are being reflected because there are discontinuities. Uh, if it is only sand without uh, change in phase or a change in grain size, you won't see those reflectors. But you, you see very nice reflectors. And one of the typical things of those reflectors is that they have all more or less the same shape. They, they, they start horizontally and then they go further down uh, with a slope and then again there's horizontally again. And the next one here as well, uh, you see the next one here. And the previous one is also, they have all the same thing. They call such a structure a clinoform. Uh, it is the form of a, uh, of a inclined sheet. Uh, here you have other clinoforms from another, another line. Here more clinoforms. And in fact, if you follow those clinoforms, uh, you see that actually the next clinoform uh, is gradually prograding more into the sea, into the North Sea than the previous one. So each one offlaps, as we say, each clinoform is going further west and so forth. And they have distinguished uh, 28 different clinoforms on top of each other. That's what Irina Overheim has been done. She is at present at the uh, Colorado State University at Boulder and uh, in America, still working a lot on, on modeling of, of the fluvial systems. But she did a wonderful job here in the, in the, in the North Sea Basin. So this is what you see here, the clinoforms. And, and what do you mean, those clinoforms? Well, uh, from your textbooks, you know uh, how deltas are being formed. Uh, this is a typical textbooks uh, example in which you see the river comes here, here from the left. Uh, and uh, the coarsest sediment, they are uh, rapidly uh, settled, set, rapidly deposited uh, because of their course grain size not far from the mouth of the delta. The somewhat kleiner silty uh, deposits, they are uh, deposited a little bit further uh, in the sea uh, because they are uh, floating for a longer time in the in, in the in the water before they can settle. Uh, they have a long, longer time need to be settled, and so they can be transported further into the sea. And the finest clay particles uh, they go furthest in the sea, and they are uh, form here at the bottom. So this is what we call the, the top set beds. Uh, that is the slope beds, uh, the four set beds also, and these are the bottom set beds. And you see that as, as long uh, uh, when the delta grows, because sediment is being continuously being put into the uh, put into the sea, then you see gradually that this delta is growing seawards. Uh, so this is the land, uh, this is the sea. So these are the timelines. Uh, once the delta was here, and you see coarse, medium, fine sediments, then uh, uh, sometime later it was here, coarse, medium, fine. And in this way, you see horizontal layers being formed uh, by the progradation, as we call it, 
of a delta. This is a very common system which works in, 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 in many deltas. The Volga delta is a bit different because it's, it has a very flat topography in, in, in the front of it. But the most deltas like Mississippi delta, which is the, the classical example, uh, they, uh, they have this built up with uh, uh, what we also call coarsening upwards uh, because here you get fine sediments at the bottom, a uh, little bit uh, coarser sediments on top of that, and here you get the coarser sediment at the top. So, so you, that's the way in you, which you can also, in all the deposits, you can uh, they recognize delta deposits, uh, because they are coarsening upwards, and that's what you see here. And you see at the same time, here, this is the actually the clinoform, the one that, that, that we saw in the seismic images. So that means here, uh, this is the way in which I've in, uh, finally uh, those clinoforms have been uh, uh, formed. And so the seismic images indicate uh, that the clinoforms that that is an old delta, and that's the delta of the Eridanos River. And that's what we are speaking about. Now, this is another seismic. Uh, Cross section uh, from unit six going to unit 23. Uh, this is a slightly sloping surface and erosional unconformity. And you see gradually offlapping more and more of those clinoforms forming in, into the basin of the uh, of the North Sea. A huge system, a huge delta. It is a, it is a 28 units, one and a half kilometers thick, two million years old. Uh, that's a huge, a huge. Uh, Delta system which is being formed there. It is not the first delta which has been formed because the nicest delta actually uh, that uh, the Eridanos River made before it came into the North Sea uh, is ex exactly in the uh, Kaliningrad area uh, in the, around the place called Jantarni, uh, which means amber place, and uh, in, in, in Poland. This is the first. Uh, oldest Eridanos delta, which is known, and it is known because this is the delta which made the deposits of the amber of the Antarni. Uh, that's the uh, uh, Mrs. Kosmovska Ciranovic was the one who gave the name Eridanos to this Bernstein Fluss, as it's called here, so it means amber river. Uh, so this is a delta, and it's of course heavily worked already for a very long time, and so. And we know that this amber also is, is deposited in this delta where we go, but that's not the way it was being formed. You know, amber uh, is risen from uh, cheer, from from uh, from trees, and uh, uh, probably sasna or or, or uh, uh, some type of uh, one with conifer trees, and it must have been forests that that were present in the upper drainage basin of the Eridanos ri River, and uh, that is the place and so where uh, the amber was coming from the trees. But the Eridanos River. Uh, brought all those amber down uh, to Yantarni, to Kaliningrad area. And uh, of course, that's where it's being mined now. So it is uh, the amber which is found there is, is not primary. It, is, it has been transported by Eridanos River. And the, the primary sources are, are actually not really very well known because uh, uh, nothing is left of the original forest that produced uh, the amber. Now, if you don't know what's amber, you have to go to Tsarskoye Sela. There is the famous uh, Catherine Palace with the Antarnia Komnata, the, the amber room. Uh, it's, it's the second one. The first one was uh, uh, stolen by the Germans in the Second World War and uh, disappeared at a certain moment. Maybe it has been burned because amber, of course, is, uh, is, uh, can be burned very easily. But this is the second. I, I visited that uh, uh, with uh, Sergei Zilitinkevich, very famous. Uh, Russian Finnish scientist who is a big friend of mine and also of uh, uh, Nikolai Sergeyevich. So we were there together and uh, they showed us this uh, in Tsarsky Cielo, this uh, wonderful uh, sculptures of uh, a room just clad with, uh, with amber. Amber from uh, Eridanos River. So it could actually be called also Eridanos River. That's where it comes from. So uh, gradually after the, 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 the amber interval, uh, you see that Eridanos is growing. Uh, this is a uh, Phil Gibbert is a very famous uh, British uh, geologist who has been studying the quaternary of the North Sea area during all his lifetime, a very active uh, man. Uh, I, I, I met him once in a conference in, in Nebraska in the United States, uh, but he, and he was also in, in the Netherlands for some time. And you see gradually, this is the North Sea. Uh, you see Eridanos was first year in mid Miocene. That's more or less the beginning of the 28 sections and so. And then you see in early Pliocene, you see it uh, gradually 
prograde, uh, you did progradation with the clinoforms, and still in the early Pleistocene, it is still further prograding into, into the North Sea. So that's uh, gradually you see how this Eridanos River is, is being formed. Uh, this is an animation made by Irina Overeem uh, of the different uh, stages of the different clinoforms she has made. And you see gradually uh, how the delta is evolved, developing. You see also how sedimentation is uh, continuing uh, to the, from the east to the west. And you see also that the North Sea is becoming shallower as a result uh, of this uh, growth of the delta. It's really filling up the North Sea, what you see here. So, um, the, the, this delta has not only been studied by looking at the um, uh, by looking at the seismics, but of course you want to know what's there. So there have been many, many borings. I showed already where they were in one of the previous slides. This is just a very small section of the drill cores they made from it. It's actually just an, il an alternation of clay and silt and clay and silt. Uh, this is a very small section. Is it uh, 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 not much sand, but silt is a bit coarser. Huh? That's alivrit. Uh, that's a coarser material than uh, than. Uh, and the clays who are really ill uh, in, the, in, in, in most of the section. Actually, all those clinoforms you see are a, a result of the fact that uh, every time uh, clay and silt alternate in the, in the, the, the respective clinoforms. So that's what you see here. So now um, I won't go into much detail about that, but what you can see is in the in those drill cores is a huge amount of data which very precisely reflect what has been uh, the history of those clinoforms, how old they are, uh, whether sea level was low or high, whether the climate was warm or, or, or cold. Uh, uh, they have been dated. It. Dating is being done by uh, measuring the magnetic polarity. Uh, you know that the present uh, uh, North Pole is in the north, uh, but 750,000 750, years ago, uh, your compass would point to the South Pole. It's flipping all the time. Uh, and uh, the, the, the polarity tra transfer uh, reversals are very well known and, uh, in, the, in the time. So they have used this to date the sequence here. And you see it starts a little bit below. Uh, three and a half million years, and then goes up to a little bit less than a little bit more than one and a half million years. Just, so, more or less two million years of sediment is present here. This is gamma ray and gamma ray uh, that, that measures the radioactivity of the sediments. And uh, clays have a lot of potassium and they are much more radioactive than sands or silts. So, every, every time that you see uh, a peak. Uh, going to the right, it means it's much clay. If a peak to the left means it's much, much silt. And you see there's a gradual transition, clay, silt, clay, silt, clay, silt, <coughs> sorry. And that is, uh, that, that is very important because it indicates uh, th that uh, the clinoforms, each of the clinoforms more or less represents a, a period of warmer and colder climate and a period of higher and lower sea level. Uh, uh, during high sea levels, you have mainly silt deposition during low sea, sea level, especially in the, the Pleistocene in the, the upper part of the sections, uh, uh, then you get may, may more clay deposition. And why are they studying this in so much detail? Because the course of sediments that are, they contain gas. Uh, one of the, the the bounties of the North Sea is not only oil, which comes from much deeper from the Cretaceous, Jurassic, uh, but here, but here in tertiary in the, in the new gene and the Pleistocene, there's gas. So they want to know where's the gas and how much is it and can they get it out. Uh, so that's those gamma ray is, is very important, used in oil, in all uh, categories of uh, uh, oil exploration because it gives you an idea if there is porous material like sands which could hold oil or gas. Uh, then they have a low a signature, low values, and if it's the, the oil is covered and uh, protected from uh, going out, uh, then it is a clay deck, uh, which is indicated by the high peaks in the in the gamma ray and so. So uh, the, on the land in the British uh, in in Britain and also in the Netherlands, uh, they have uh, names for the different periods in which it comes. Uh, the seawater temperature can be derived from dinoflagellates uh, that are small 
plant-like organisms, which mainly living uh, are plankton in the sea. And uh, from the species, you can see whether it was warm or cold water. Uh, this is benthic forums, which you see here, foraminifera, this is other uh, uh, foraminifera. This is still new gene plankton, all kinds of bio strategic, bio indicators indicating, indicating whether the sea level was saline or uh, fresh, whether uh, what kind of species were living there. Pollen events, uh, pollen, from plants, they give you an idea about the vegetation around the North Sea, and you also see that changing with climate change. So it is a very powerful a series of data which indicate uh, how actually uh, this delta has been formed, how climate change has changed all the time uh, the uh, depositional conditions and uh, e ecological conditions in the North Sea and the, and the surrounding areas. So this is just one of the many holes that has been studied in this way. And therefore, it's a very important uh, section anyway. Well, as I said on the land, there are also deposits from uh, Eridanos River. Uh, and this is just a picture from Denmark uh, when you see also the cross bedding. It's a, on, on the land, it's a bit coarser. Eh? It's not deep water there, of course. It's fluval sediments. Uh, this is a very nice uh, outcrop in, the, in Denmark. We have them in the Netherlands as well. Uh, in the Netherlands, the Eridanos River is characterized also by white sands, just like in, in Denmark. Only in Holland, we have the problem uh, that Holland is uh, the sink uh, of many deltas, not only from the Eridanos uh, in the early times, but also from the River Rhine, which comes here from Germany, and the River Meuse, which comes here from uh, from Belgium. And so there are many deposits in which uh, uh, there is a mixture of Rhine and Meuse and Eridanos sediments. And I have tried with one of my students, uh, Leo Tebbins, to find out how we can distinguish the sediments of Eridanos from those of Rhine and Meuse. And uh, we came to the solution that we picked out the garnets in the heavy mineral concentrates from the, from the river deposits. Uh, the river deposit mainly consists of quartz and a little bit feldspar. And one or two percent are heavy minerals like garnet or hornblende of epidote, which are very common uh, and, and give a very good idea about the conditions in the drainage basin. So we started to look at, at the sediments which we knew were from the Rhine, and we see those have gar garnets which have mainly deposits, uh, have mainly garnets with a, a high amount of uh, iron and magnesium. Here you see it, iron magnesium at the top. And there's an almondine, mainly had the iron rich, rich uh, garnets. Uh, and that's very typical for uh, for the Rhine. Here you see another also from the lower Pleistocene and the upper and the upper uh, uh, tertiary. Uh, so you see very typical. Those are every data point is a, a garnet composition which we measured with the electron microprobe. Now the Meuse is, is quite different. You can see it because the Meuse has a lot of spessartine, the manganese garnets from the Ardennes. That is a low grade metamorphic. Uh, garnet types which are typically developed in the in the Ardennes area. And the white sands, uh, he said they have a much rather uh, larger spread of garnet compositions, not so much manganese, but still quite a lot of uh, different, also more towards the calcium, the gracularite type of, uh, of garnets. So this indicates that, of course, the drainage basin of Eridanus is much bigger. So those granites come from the whole of Scandinavia. And it's, it's no surprise that you find a bigger spread of data. Uh, but that's how, how we can dis distinguish this, uh, the different uh, river types by the, the type of heavy minerals that are being deposited. At present, you would also take this as uh, already some time ago. You would take the zircons from the sediments and try to date them. And of course, then you will find much older uh, zircons from Eridanos than from Rhine and Meuse, because Eridanos drainage basin is in the Precambrian Baltic Shield, and Rhine and Meuse are in the Paleozoic uh, and the Mesozoic uh, origins of, uh, of uh, Central Europe mainly. Huh? But then a disaster occurs, huh? and that disaster means glaciation, ice ages, huh? because further high up in the Pleistocene, uh, we, we get several times that big glaciers, big ice caps are covering huh? the, the Elsterian, the Salian. Huh? Uh, you have a Moscow glaciation here, and uh, uh, they have they have also all the, the different Russian names, which I don't remember exactly by by head. But uh, you see, this is the Elsterian, the the, the, the uh, three the the, uh, the pre penultimate glaciation. This is the, the last but one, last but two, last but one glaciation. This is the one which went furthest, furthest, and covered also the Netherlands and Denmark and so on. 
and uh, we see that effect in the seismic images of the North Sea, because suddenly we saw deep holes in those clinoforms here. And in, in oh, this is in the Danish part. You see that they form huge channels, and these are no longer river channels, as you see, but these are channels, meltwater channels below the ice cap, which at that time covered uh, Western Europe. Within the channels, you can also see some stratification, and this is also in the North Sea. So you see this, actually, there's something happened uh, to Scandinavia. And you can imagine what happened, what happened to the Baltic, uh, to, uh, to Eridanos River. It was all covered with ice. Uh, that's uh, something that uh, suddenly interrupted the whole series of delta formation in the North Sea about one and a half million years ago already. Uh, and there have been many, 20, certainly 20 ice ages, but we do not know the effect of, uh, of the earliest ones, but those are Elstirian, uh, so the last but two. Uh, ice age, which is very prominent to be found in the seismic sections of the, of the North Sea. In the Netherlands, we call it the push moraines. Eh? The, the moraines is coming, the, the, the ice cap is coming and pushing the previous sediments uh, into tectonic slices, almost, you could see uh, here. And they put also some sediment on top of it. Uh, this is the present push moraines uh, in, the, uh, in the Netherlands, very uh, prominent uh, features. Netherlands, not totally flat, but because of the the ice movement in the penultimate glaciation, you get that that, uh, uh, that you get some hills here. And these are the 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 white sands of Eridanos who have been affected by the the pushing ice cap because you can see this is a fault. Uh, this is a fault line. This line is suddenly stopping here and it's going further here. Uh, this line it stops here and then it goes further here. This is a reverse fault. The result uh, of pushing of the ice age of the of the ice cap in the penultimate glaciation. So you see that uh, here, in fact, um, there is very clear that uh, the deformation in the Everdanus uh, is the result of uh, uh, deformation of the, the ice cap that uh, rolled over the Netherlands and um, scoured deep valleys 100 meters deep. It left a lot of sediment as well. And eh? so this is in a very different type of sediment, of sediment from the Eridanos than we know from um, uh, from the delta, uh, these are big chunks of uh, uh, of rocks, Scandinavian rocks, uh, from uh, Sweden and Finland mainly, and they have been used by prehistoric people, people, Neolithic people, three thousand years before the Common Era, uh, to build probably tombs, dolmens they call it, and there are many of them in, in in the Netherlands and also in Germany. But all those rocks come from Scandinavia, and actually. Uh, uh, there, there are a lot of archaeologists and, and geologists who have been trying to find out exactly where a certain rock type comes from, and they made, have been able to reconstruct exactly the, 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 the pathways of the flow of the ice by looking at where does the, uh, the, uh, the, those erratics, as they are called, uh, the erratics, erratic, where they really come from, and so on. And there's a Dutch artist, a very nice man called Bart Eising Smeets. And uh, this summer, he went, he brought one of those erratics back to where it had come from. This is a Rapakivi granite uh, from Oland's uh, Island, or, or Angelanma, as they say in Finnish. Uh, and uh, he brought it back. This is the mayor of, of Marian Hagina. Uh, and uh, this is the, the rock which he was, he, he, he brought back. He said, he has nostalgia, this rock. It wants to go back where it came from. Huh? Very nice uh, story. So it, it is a, it's not theology, it's, it's art. And I, I like this kind of art. This, this town has some kind of memory where he came from and he really wanted to return to the place in the, those uh, Avenalma, Oland Islands, between the, the archipelago between Finland and Sweden. So well, very nice. I love it. I love it. It's, it's a very nice story. And another effect is that the moraines that came from the east uh, also were deposited in the North Sea. So the ember that came from the Antarne was also deposited, also transported by the glaciers much further west. And here, this is an ember which was found in the island of Ameland in the Dutch Frisian Islands. Uh, and so it, it, is, it comes from the moraines that were deposited by the glaciers in the North Sea and the waves transported it to the shore. So this is ember from the Antarne uh, actually, the second place where it has been transported, because the first place was, of course, uh, in uh, uh, from uh, from Estonia to uh, 
uh, to Kaliningrad, and, and this is the, the transportation by the moraines and now by the waves to, to Ameland. So we find amber in Holland, eh? but it is uh, amber, which is of course Baltic amber, which has had a long history to, to get there. So, well, in the, during the last ice age, eh, the last, this is about 20,000 years ago, again, a nice uh, ice cap was formed in the same area. Eh? And it, it's for the maybe third or fourth or fifth time, uh, the, the Eridanos uh, Valley was, was filled with ice. Uh, and actually, this is the last, the uh, glacial maximum, the, the lar largest extension of, uh, of ice uh, in the last glacial. We see that it, it came just across Denmark, but not to the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we had periglacial permafrost, but not, uh, not ice cap. All the, the ice cap is from the previous uh, glaciation. Very important. This is, of course, the one that has been studied best. Huh? Uh, one of the possibilities is that uh, uh, the pro-glacial lakes that were here made all the rivers that are now flowing northwards, like the, the northern Drina and Pechora and so on, southwards and link up with the Caspian Sea, where we have been working a lot with Nikolai Sergeyevich. Uh, so, but uh, this last uh, glaciation is, is known very well. Uh, and uh, this is a, an older picture, but it is very nice because you see in here not only uh, the, the, the height of the ice, uh, the, the contours, but you see also the flow lines. And what you see very nicely here is that the Eridanos River was a glacier of its own. Uh, this is the glacier tongue of the Eridanos Glacier. And that is the reason why the river disappeared. It was scoured deeply by the ice and it, the, the, the ice didn't care at all that it was an older river basin. But of course it followed the last, the, the, the lowest parts of the, of the topography. And therefore it is the ice uh, tongue which scoured out the whole uh, uh, drainage basin of the, uh, of the Eridanos uh, river. And therefore it is as wide as it is now. Uh, that's 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 actually the reason the ice made uh, killed you could say the, the Eridanos River as a river. Uh, this is a very beautiful image uh, which I got from the internet, uh, in which you see what the bottom of the Baltic looks like at present uh, as a result of the scouring of the ice. Uh, this is uh, here is Kaliningrad. You see where we are. Uh, this is the Jantarni area here. This is here Sweden. Here is Stockholm. Uh, well, this is really wonderful. Uh, we, you can imagine that a river uh, cannot uh, follow all those uh, deep. Uh, there's no way that this can be returned in a river when uh, at, at the end of the of the nice uh, of the ice age. You cannot follow that. Well, after at, at the end of the last ice age, uh, the ice was retreating uh, and. Uh, uh, a lot of melt water came in what is then the, the Baltic Sea, of course, we had a, a fresh water lake here. Uh, 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 and then when the, the, the cap became smaller and smaller, there come a corridor from the North Sea into the, the Baltic Sea. And you see that, that a, a new uh, a salt water uh, uh, sea is being, saline sea is being formed. But then gradually the land lifts up and it becomes again uh, a freshwater lake, and then the last stage in which is more or less the, the present situation, uh, sea level rise was so strong that it overcome uh, the uplift of the Scandinavian area, and therefore it's now a sea again. And so you see, this is also the, the history uh, of the sea level. It's, it is coming up, it's falling down, falling down, and it's coming up again. This is the, the four tires uh, history of the Baltic Sea. And the uh, seismic data have also been uh, obtained uh, from the present bottom of the Baltic Sea. And there you see those different, the, those different stages. The Ancillus Lake, uh, the, the third stage, uh, very typical sediments here. Uh, this is Litorina, that is the, the, the last stage, more or less. Here is re recent sedimentation going on. Uh, uh, this is thickness about 10, 10 meters, quite a different thing than the one and a half kilometer of we had in the Eridanos Delta. But actually, uh, this is more lake deposits or marine deposits and no longer river deposits. But active sedimentation is, is going on. So this is the, the start say, of the Holocene, the period in which we live now. And we see that uh, it still is happening something. Uh, 
But if we look at present day sediments, oh, well, just one, one, one other point. Uh, we see that the, 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 uh, the deposits going from north to south are getting thicker in the whole Bal Baltic Sea, going from uh, northern Sweden and Finland to Denmark. You see, gradually uh, it is, uh, it's getting thicker. And so on. these are the four stages that we just have seen so far. Now, but if you look at present bottom sediments, and you are interested in pollution of rivers, of course, and these are data from the Suomen uh, University Keskus, the Finnish uh, Environmental uh, Agency, and you see that uh, quite a lot of uh, heavy metals, uh, cadmium, mercury, lead, nickel, chromium, uh, arsenic, uh, copper, zinc are uh, above the limits that are allowed for the maximum limits, uh, mercury and, and, and chromium uh, come from different rivers. It's mainly industry in the, in the Gulf of Finland where there's uh, high amounts of uh, sediments, uh, of uh, polluting sediments come from. Uh, so we see that uh, the, the present day situation is, is not so good uh, because of the, all, the, uh, all of the sediments that come into the the sea, the contaminated sediments that come into the sea. Maybe that's not even the worst, but if we look at the bottom, bottom sediments, <coughs> we, see, uh, we see barrels, uh, we see shipwrecks uh, on the bottom of the Finnish Gulf. This is Estonia Ferry, uh, which was uh, uh, sunk in, uh, in, along the west coast of, of Finland. So that is present day sediment, no longer clay silts or, or big erratics, but this is the, these are the, the modern, type of bottom sediments you find, uh, unfortunately, so it's, it's, it is uh, very much polluted so far. Um, so, but anyway, uh, uh, yeah, we see also uh, military chemical waste dump near the island, the Danish island of Bornholm. Uh, uh, they say, well, it is uh, rather safe there, uh, but uh, uh, we cannot see it uh, in the sediments, but there must be uh, quite a lot of chemical war warfare uh, agents here which have been dropped here uh, uh, to get rid of them. So, so that is in the born, born home. So actually the, the bottom of the Baltic Sea is, is quite polluted, as so you could say. Well, and now they made a new Eridanus, not for, for water, but for gas. This is Nord Stream, uh, the Nord Stream pipeline, eh, which goes through the Finnish Gulf between Est Estonia and Finland, uh, across Sweden. They, they, they don't go too, that's too, bad. It's too quick. Uh, through uh, Germany, well, the, the one uh, right through the, the chemical waste dump from uh, from uh, Bornholm to Germany uh, to bring Russian gas to Western Europe, and you know all the political uh, discussions that go on to make a, a second pipeline, or but it is uh, the per first pipeline is, is functioning, functioning. So this is Nord Stream, and actually I I regard it as the resurrection of Eridanos, it flows again, <clears throat> but now with gas and no longer with water. Uh, so that's uh, actually very interesting to see how uh, uh, in a very different way, uh, there is still uh, matter flowing from uh, say uh, St. Petersburg and its air and the area to Germany, uh, no longer uh, uh, fresh river water, but gas through a pipeline. Now, uh, we look a little bit at the future. Uh, this, uh, we almost finished. Uh, but we look at the future. Well, if we look at the Finnish coast and the Swedish coast, <coughs> you see something strange is happening. Uh, 300 years uh, from, of the common area, era, uh, so after Christ, you could say, uh, this was the coast, uh, west coast of Finland in, uh, in, in southwestern Finland. And you see the coast has been growing. Uh, it has been growing. This is the town of Vasa uh, in uh, every time more islands emerge and so so what's this we are all used to think about sea level rise and so but here it seems to be the opposite here it seems that sea level is falling how is that possible or is the land going up that is something that you have to to imagine now we know actually what's happening there because on the Celsius, uh, the man that gave us our temperature scale has been finding it out in the, the east coast of Sweden. And uh, <coughs> he found evidence uh, that the, the coast is uplifting. Uh, and this is the Lovgren stone on the Swedish coast. And you see, he made a mark here. Uh, 1731 was this, this was the sea level. 1878, uh, this was the sea level. 
1888 it was here, so you see it's uplifting. Uh, this is the, the sea level curve of Stockholm uh, from 16,000 years ago to now, to now, and you see actually that also uh, this is not sea level rise, but sea level fall. And how does it come that Scandinavia has sea level fall and uh, the rest of the world has sea level rise? Well, again, this has to do with the ice cap. This is just a picture of England, doesn't matter what you take. When there's an ice cap forming, uh, uh, the ice cap pushes the land surface down into the Earth's mantle uh, because it is plastic and so. And as a result of that, uh, uh, viscous material from the Earth's mantle flows uh, uh, from beyond the, the from, from under the, the ice cap uh, further to the south. So this area is being uplifted here in the ice age. And when the ice cap melts, then you get the opposite effect. All those uh, viscous material in the earth mantle flows back and therefore you get uh, uplift here uh, in, the, in this area where the ice cap has, uh, uh, where the ice cap has uh, disappeared and sinking here. So uh, land, land is sinking here. We in the Netherlands, unfortunately, are sinking here. That's one of the reasons why we have a lot of problems with, with sea level rise. But in Scotland and also in Scandinavia, they don't have this problem. Uh, this is a this gives uh, shows that uh, the northern part of the Botnik Gulf uh, is still rising at a rate of 19, eight or nine centimeters a year. Uh, so that's why it's growing. Uh, it, is, it has been uplifted already more than 300 meters uh, the whole of Scandinavia. So that is actually uh, why the land is uplifting. This is actually the contour of the old ice cap. That, so that's why it's up uplifting. And if you look a little bit further, this is. If you look here in this in this area, southwestern coast of Finland, again the town of Vasa, which we saw in the previous slide, uh, uh, in 4,000 years there will be a land bridge between Vasa between Finland and Sweden, and Eridanos River will lose part of its uh, uh, drainage basin because uh, the uplift makes that a connection between Sweden and Finland here uh, after uh, uh, as a result of a continuing uplift. Uh, so uh, you, you might ask what happens to North Stream? Huh? It's, it's further south, but uh, uh, of course the sea is also getting shallower at the place where North Stream is, uh, is starting. I'm not sure that uh, they had where they have thought of it. Of course, this is not the final problem that they have. The final problem comes in the next ice age when there is a new ice cap, maybe uh, 20,000, maybe 50,000 years from now, in which again, St. Petersburg is covered by ice, Helsinki, Stockholm, Oslo, Copenhagen, Berlin are all disappeared. Uh, they all become incorporated in the push moraines uh, in, in the Western half of Denmark, or maybe even in the Netherlands, but also uh, England and so is go. Uh, and you see, uh, because sea level is dropping then, so the Azov Sea is getting dry, Venice is getting dry. Uh, so all those people have to find a new place to live uh, and, uh, of course, the North Sea is also dry, so we get some extra country <coughs> in the Netherlands for the refugees in, in this area. So it, it, it takes a lot of time, but if you look at the longer history uh, of Eridanos and uh, in general of, of climate history, we are going already to the next ice age. Uh, the, the, the maximum temperature was 6,000 years ago. It goes very slowly, uh, very slowly before we come at the next ice age and smaller climate change are being superimposed of it on, on, on it, uh, uh, like the little ice age and that kind of uh, periods. And, uh, but sooner or later, in couple of 10,000 years, the ice cap will return. Uh, it has actually already returned in Hardanger Vida and one of the small glaciers in, 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 the, part of, in the, the, the southern part, the higher part of Norway, uh, but they, they still have to extend quite a lot before they can get the same uh, extent. So what will happen then? Uh, uh, then we will find the erratics of uh, the erratics of the Eridanos Delta uh, in, the, in the area that was uh, at, the, at the foot or at the uh, of the next uh, ice age. This is more or less how it will look like. Uh, this, this is uh, Ozero Bieli in, in, in northern Russia at present. But you see the barrels that were at the bottom of the uh, at the bottom of Finnish Gulf, they will be deposited at the end. And what happened to North Stream? Well, uh, probably something like that. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you a lot, Professor Cronenberg. Uh, for the excellent talk.
Uh, and I would uh, now uh, proceed with the questions which we got from the participants. Uh, so we have some minutes for that. So uh, just firstly, uh, so I just would read the, the question that we got. So the question from the student of geochemistry of landscape department of Moscow State University. Uh, so when was the Eridanus discovered? Are there any connection between Eridanus deltas and uh, Curonian split formation? Which formation, sorry? Curonian. 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 Curonian, right. But Curonian, that is uh, four billion years ago. Huh? That's uh, C U R O N I A N. So C I, I, I don't understand. Uh, okay, then maybe when when was the Eridanus discovered? So maybe that's, that's the uh, point can be. Well, um, uh, uh, the, the deltas were actually discovered in this uh, for the first time described by my PhD student and uh, and uh, Catherine Bishop K in the in the in the UK. This was the first paper on on the delta, but the older delta was already found in the, uh, as I told in the, in the Antarni area in the. In Kalinin, Kalinin Galat area, uh, but uh, the that it, it was such a huge delta is, is recent, relatively recently uh, known. Uh, there must have been a, a, a precursor. Uh, uh, the the actual shape of the the the, the Baltic with the, the Gulf of Finland is, according to some geologists, already related uh, to old rift in the Baltic Shield, which can be indeed a Huronian or Precambrian at least. Eh? So uh, so why is there uh, this, this Gulf of Finland? Uh, the primary could be a tectonic. Not that the scientists do not agree about it, but it can be very old. Uh, so that uh, the, actually the, the pathway of the river itself could have been formed by very old tectonics already several billion years ago. Yeah? Is that uh, the answer to the question? So I think I think yes. I can't ask the participant if he, if he is <laughs> agreed, but I, I hope yes. That's quite yeah, clear. Yeah. Okay. The, then the, the, I go forward with the next question. It's uh, the question from Mikhail Makarov. Uh, so, um, so does global warming affect the spread of the Eridanus River? And if yes, then by how much? So I guess it's a little. Well, bit well the river doesn't exist at this moment. Eh? So, uh, and uh, the. Uh, present day uh, uh, global warming uh, contributes a little bit, for instance, to the, the to the melting of the Greenland glacier. Uh, but what we see at present is that the land uplift uh, of Scandinavia goes much quicker uh, than uh, uh, than uh, the sea level rise as a result of uh, of the melting glaciers. Uh, the sea level rise goes in, uh, in uh, uh, more or less at um, at 20 cent in the Netherlands, for instance, 20, 20 centimeters per century. Uh, that's the, the, already since the 19th century. Uh, uh, but um, the, the the Scandinavia rises up eight, eight centimeters per year. That uh, is, it goes much much quicker. So in Scandinavia and and and, uh, and so also St. Petersburg and Kaliningrad, they will not be affected by. Uh, by sea level rise, but rather by sea level fall as a result of the uplift of the scale. In the North Sea, of course, it's it's different. Uh, we see as a result of the sinking around the, the old area of the ice cap, we see uh, uh, that uh, more sediment is being deposited uh, there. And, uh, and so the North Sea is rising, but but still not, not very quickly. We don't see, for instance, an, uh, uh, an increase as a result of uh, an acceleration of sea level rise in the North Sea area as a result of uh, the CO2 output. We don't see it. It's, uh, it's all, whatever you look along the whole North Sea, it is more or less 15 to 20 centimeters per century. Uh, so uh, if sea level rise uh, affects coasts elsewhere, it's not here. Yeah. Okay, very, very, yes, very uh, detailed. Uh, vision. Uh, so, and I, I think we, as far as we are a bit short in time, so I would uh, translate one more question. Uh, there are a few more, but uh, so that there is the question from uh, PhD student of hydrology department, also of the Moscow State University, Vasily Efimov. So the question is whether it is possible to say that the sand massif of Dogger Bank was formed mainly by deposits of the Eridanus River. 
I, I cannot see your mouth. You, 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 it was about Dogger. Yes, please. Yeah. What's about Dogger Bank? What's the question? Yes, yes, yes. So it is the question. It's possible to say that the Saint Massif, Saint Massif of the Dogger Bank, yeah, was formed mainly by deposits of the Iridanos. No, that's not right. It was formed as a result of uh, the, the the push moraines in the in the penultimate glaciation. Eh? It is a, so. It, it is a glacial remain and, and not an Eridanos remain. It it is resting on Eridanos deposits, eh? but uh, it itself is uh, the, the Douglas Bank itself is is, is partly is the result of, of glacial processes. Uh, it's a very interesting because. When sea level was rising uh, until about 7,000 years ago, the Douglas Bank was an island in the North Sea and uh, people lived there. So you, there, that must have been one of the greatest environmental disasters in the, in the period when the people at that time saw the, the, their island becoming smaller, smaller and smaller. They all must have drowned, drowned uh, say 7,000 years ago. So if they want to make a hub, there for the, the, the windmill electricity, but what they will find is the, the bones of the people who drowned there 7,000 years ago. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, we would so then uh, finish with uh, Professor Cronenberg talks. Uh, uh, again, uh, I'm very proud, to, we are very proud to have your lecture here. It's, I, I think it's the, in the big list of your presentations in Moscow State University. It's <laughs> like you. a big, big, big collection of that, yes. uh, of your talks. So thank you very much that you came. And uh, I hope to meet you next summer in the Baikal Lake then. I, I hope so too, yes. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have okay. now the few minutes break. Yeah. And at 12 we will continue, so. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye bye.
Okay, so wait. we start, yes? Eddie, we can start? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, welcome to the, the next talk in, in this program today. So I'm A.D. Collins from the United Kingdom and I'm going to give a very brief talk uh, on some work that's been ongoing in my group for a number of years now wherein we've been looking at the exceedance of modern background sediment loss to rivers across England and Wales uh, and considering the scope for closing any gap uh, using best management practices. So if we consider um, sediment loss across England and Wales, I guess in the global context, our suspended sediment yields are um, extremely low compared to those in many parts of, of the world, with typical losses uh, uh, across much of the country being in the range of, uh, of only 20 to 35 tonnes per square kilometre uh, per year. Uh, and you can see the yellow band there, which is uh, calcareous chalk geology. We see we have extremely low suspended sediment yields, <coughs> typically uh, six or less tonnes per square kilometre per year. So in the global context, our suspended sediment yields uh, are uh, extremely low. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a sediment problem. And, and one of the reasons for that is that... Um, we have ecologically sensitive river systems. So despite having low sediment yields, the off-site impacts uh, are still recognized as being a serious issue. Uh, a high proportion of our river basins continue to fail uh, water quality standards, uh, the water framework directive standards for good ecological status. Uh, and in some cases, fine sediment uh, is a key driver of uh, that non-compliance. Uh, now, from around the 1970s, much of the early work on soil erosion and sediment loss in, in the UK um, focused very much on, on the problem for uh, arable land, uh, because this was visually uh, most uh, evident, particularly where we saw clear volumetric evidence of an erosion problem, so rilling, uh, and uh, gullying. Uh, and there was uh, a large body of work completed by people like Bob Evans and, and John Boardman in particular. Uh, and this frequently showed uh, loss rates of uh, a few tens of uh, a few tens of tons per hectare uh, per year. But in extreme cases on our arable land, extreme events or highly erodible soils, we could see loss rates of the low hundreds of tons uh, per hectare uh, per year. Uh, in terms of sediment delivery from arable land uh, and off-site impacts, one key issue here is that um, a substantial proportion of our farmed land uh, has assisted drainage in, in the form uh, of uh, field drains. Uh, and these, for instance, were supported by capital grants to our farmers between the 1950s and, and the 1990s. Now, where land drains are well maintained, of course, they can do a great deal in terms of improving connectivity uh, and accelerating the delivery of, of any sediment that has been mobilised from uh, arable uh, fields. But from around the 1990s onwards, there was growing recognition that in addition to uh, erosion and sediment loss from arable land, uh, that in many instances there could be issues associated with the intensive management of our grassland. And as you can see from this map, actually grassland is our dominant land cover, so a map of just England there, but in essence about two-thirds of our agricultural land uh, is dominated by uh, grassland, with much of that being intensively managed, improved uh, grassland. 
So as I say, from the 1990s, there was a growing recognition that actually soil loss and, and sediment delivery from intensively managed grassland was also a problem. Now, of course, the loss rates here because of the perennial vegetation cover are typically much lower than those on arable land. Um, and typical rates would only be 0.3 tonnes per hectare per year or, or even less if the grassland is very well managed. But of course, because grassland is spatially dominant in many of our catchment systems, those small rates do accumulate to uh, contribute to off-site problems associated with sediment delivery to uh, the receiving rivers. And again, in, in many areas, we have that assisted drainage provided by uh, the field drains, which, as I mentioned, uh, were uh, supported by capital grants after World War II. Um, but in fact, in many areas, there are much earlier field drains and, and where those are in reasonable condition. Uh, as I said earlier, they do tend to uh, improve connectivity and, and accelerate delivery uh, of sediment uh, off site. And of course, um, like many other catchment systems globally, we also have eroding channel banks. These are uh, an important sediment source. Uh, nationally, they're responsible for contributing about 20% of the total fine sediment load delivered to rivers across England and uh, Wales. Uh, and in individual catchments, in many instances, uh, channel banks can actually be uh, one of the dominant, if not the dominant, uh, fine uh, sediment source. So, it's not just our topsoils. Um, our topsoils are typically losing around two and a half million tonnes of soil per year nationally across England and Wales. As I say, channel banks uh, are also nationally about a fifth uh, uh, of the problem uh, across England and uh, Wales. Um, but I guess the key message here uh, is that agricultural topsoils are uh, nationally the dominant source in most of our water bodies, uh, as shown in this map here. And as I say, annually, we typically have around two and a half million tonnes of uh, soil lost from our uh, agricultural soils under uh, crops or, or intensive grazing uh, management uh, lost to our rivers uh, every, uh, every year. So we do have uh, a sediment problem nationally in England and, and Wales, and um, this in turn ha has resulted in some attention uh, on the issue of sediment management uh, targets. And a few years ago, uh, I led a research project uh, into this issue, and, and one of the first things we did was actually review national and international approaches towards setting management targets for the fine sediment problem. And that paper, which was published in uh, Hydrological Processes back in 2011, uh, identified two key groups of management targets. There was one group based on uh, water column metrics. So uh, these targets are typically based on things like light penetration, uh, turbidity, suspended sediment concentration summary statistics uh, and sediment regimes. And then the second group of management targets typically focus very much on the river substrate uh, and look at things like substrate composition or embeddedness, or in other instances, um, riffle stability or, or relative bed uh, uh, stability. Now, uh, in the United Kingdom at the time of, of that work, um, whilst the Water Framework Directive, the European Water Framework Directive, which was introduced back in 2000, uh, was the key policy for water quality, uh, it didn't actually specify itself uh, a uh, sediment management target. And so the UK, like other countries, adopted a, uh, a global target, a single strategic ecological target, uh, which came from the Freshwater Fish Directive. And that stipulated uh, an annual mean suspended sediment concentration target of 25 uh, milligrams uh, per uh, litre. And very much uh, uh, of that was based upon 
uh, the perceived impacts are of concentrations exceeding that threshold on uh, freshwater salmonids. Um, now, the Freshwater Fish Directive um, ended up being repealed uh, back in December 2013. But at the time uh, that we started the journey for this work, um, that was used as uh, a national strategic target for our river systems in England uh, and Wales. And so we undertook some work um, to estimate uh, total sediment inputs from a number uh, of sources and uh, we combine that information, those loads, with uh, information on discharge nationally uh, and then uh, mapped the likelihood of good ecological status using that freshwater fish directive target, that annual mean concentration of 25 milligrams per litre. And as you can see in the left-hand map there, uh, this work um, suggested that actually the majority of our systems were compliant uh, against the freshwater fish directive, but you can see that the likelihood of good status on that basis uh, was not particularly high uh, in, in certain areas uh, uh, across uh, England uh, and Wales. Uh, where there was non-compliance uh, um, on the basis of the freshwater fish directive, then this original piece of work suggested that um, sediment loss rates from the diffuse agricultural source would need to be reduced in some areas by uh, between uh, 60 uh, and 80 percent, so a substantial reduction. But one of the issues here was that the map on the left really ignited debate about whether it was appropriate to use a single strategic target nationally for all river systems, irrespective of rainfall, soils, uh, connectivity uh, and slopes, etc. And so um, this meant that we returned uh, to uh, our review uh, of international approaches for setting sediment management targets. Uh, and we decided as a research team uh, that we um, would consider developing something which would fall in the box of uh, sediment regimes. So uh, another example of a water column metric, but this time we would uh, consider a regime uh, based uh, approach. And so um, this resulted in us considering the scope for setting uh, intrinsic uh, targets for sediment loss. Now, when we investigated existing evidence from um, paleolimnology, it became very apparent that if we wanted to set truly intrinsic sediment loss targets, um, then we would be returning to um, sediment loss rates uh, that would predate the period AD 1100 to 1400. And that's important in the long term history of sediment loss nationally, because that period was associated with the widespread uptake of the plow uh, in our agricultural systems. Now, of course, in terms of modern world, uh, we have about 67 million people on our small island and we do need to produce food. Uh, and so the notion of setting such harsh, um, uh, truly intrinsic targets for sediment loss um, was certainly not deemed to be appropriate in, in the policy context. And so uh, our discussions continued. Uh, and we then considered the scope for setting modern background sediment delivery uh, to rivers targets. And, and here uh, we identified 19 sites nationally which had well dated uh, sediment profiles and reconstructions of uh, sediment loss and, and much of this work uh, uh, came from uh, a database which has been compiled by uh, Ian Foster, one of my collaborators. Uh, and when we reviewed uh, the evidence from uh, those well-dated late calls, we were able to identify uh, some modern background loss rates which predated the intensification of our agricultural systems uh, post uh, World War uh, Two. Now, uh, our discussions over this um, were very widespread and varied, and 
we envisage that this information could be used in two ways. We could either use the information to set modern background targets for sediment loss to rivers, or, to, or an alternative way of using this information would be to use that to correct uh, any sediment gap uh, in excess of an alternative management target. Uh, and at the time, we decided that we would propose modern background loss uh, as uh, a, a new way of setting management targets for the sediment problem uh, in England and uh, Wales. Um, now, when we reviewed the um, high quality data for those 19 sites, we were able to uh, link those sites to dominant land cover uh, and in so doing, we were able to estimate um, two uh, modern background uh, targets, a target modern background sediment delivery to rivers, and then a maximum modern background sediment delivery to rivers. And we considered that the ranges provided by those two sets of numbers was our best attempt at trying to provide some uncertainty uh, around uh, these numbers. Now, in turn, we were able to then use those estimates uh, and come up uh, for each kilometre square uh, with spatially weighted uh, estimates of uh, either target modern background sediment delivery to rivers or maximum modern background uh, sediment delivery uh, to uh, rivers. Uh, and um, those maps of these new management targets are, are, are shown uh, in this uh, particular uh, slide. And so what we were aiming at here was that we would use these as management targets for the sediment problem. And that because we had managed to link the underpinning paleolimnological evidence to different land cover types, then we were able to provide at least some uh, regional variation in these management targets rather than using the single global target nationally uh, which had been provided by the Freshwater Fish uh, Directive. Now, once we'd set the uh, sediment targets, of course, we also needed to consider um, the national map for uh, compliance. Now, when we try to estimate what the sediment gap is, uh, we try to conceptualize uh, the system in two ways. The first element of uh, the system that we consider is what is the loss of sediment to rivers that might be in excess of modern background sediment delivery uh, that is driven by what I would call structural land cover. So the amount of sediment loss that is driven by uh, the proportions of land used for cropping, for grazing or for woodland, but taking into account also the animal uh, stocking uh, densities. And so we used information available to us to come up with our best estimates of sediment delivery to rivers for all water bodies across England and Wales, which was driven by the structural land cover. And this suggested that nationally, the total excess sediment loss to our rivers uh, over and above modern background sediment delivery uh, targets amounted to about 1.3 uh, million tonnes uh, per hectare uh, per year. And um, if we consider that national loss in excess of target modern background sediment delivery to rivers, then uh, the excess sediment loss uh, would equate to environmental damage costs of around uh, £523 uh, million pounds, uh, per uh, year. In addition to trying to understand the proportion of any exceedance of the modern background rates, which is driven by structural land cover, 
we were also interested in trying to understand the impact of uh, the uptake of current best management. Now, of course, uh, as in many other countries, we have policy mechanisms that encourage farmers to implement best management practices. And in the UK, those policy mechanisms are uh, typically uh, a combination of regulation, uh, incentivization, where we have agri-environment schemes which pay farmers to do certain best management practices. Uh, and then we also have uh, uh, advisory networks with one particular important national program being uh, catchment sensitive farming, where we have a network of advisors working on the ground nationally uh, and advising farmers on uh, best management practices uh, relevant to their particular environmental settings uh, and uh, farm systems. Now, one of the things that my group has been working on for a number of years now is building a national database uh, of commercial farms uh, and understanding their uh, current uptake of best management practices. And the map in the middle, again, just for England only, shows our uh, database of commercial farms. We have uh, 99,000 farms represented uh, within uh, this particular uh, uh, database. And uh, as you can see in the table on the left, it covers all of our main uh, farm system types. So everything from intensive cereals to uh, specialist pigs and poultry, dairy systems, and also our, our grazing livestock and mixed farming systems. And we're using this framework to um, come up with our best estimates of the current implementation of best management practices, including things like riparian buffer strips. And uh, the photograph on the right shows an example uh, of a riparian buffer strip. And we can clearly see where it's managed to trap some fine sediment, which has been mobilized from uh, the adjacent uh, uh, field, which uh, is under a cropping uh, regime. Now, um, in doing this part of the uh, exercise, um, the impacts of, of best management uh, actually are very slight. And uh, if we look nationally, best management under business as usual has actually only reduced the total sediment loss nationally which is in excess of modern background sediment delivery rates from 1.3 to about 1.2 million tonnes per year. So it's only reduced the environmental damage costs from about 520 uh, million pounds per year to 462 million pounds per year. And so what we've really been driving at here is that uh, Unfortunately, um, our current uptake of best management practice is not actually sufficient for closing any sediment gap that exists uh, in excess of uh, our best estimates of modern background sediment delivery uh, to uh, rivers. Now, Doing this type of work and understanding best management, of course, uh, is an ongoing job and we are constantly reviewing or indeed measuring uh, the impacts of um, on-farm best management practices. Uh, and when we assemble this information and use it in our computations, um, we're very interested in trying to capture uh, the efficacy of individual options, both in terms of their sort of typical uh, efficacy for reducing sediment loss, but again, trying to assign some uncertainty ranges uh, around those numbers. And in this slide, I'm just showing some of the best management practices that are recommended uh, here at home. So we see options like reciting gateways away from uh, high risk areas, farm track management, cultivate and drill across the slope rather than up and down the slope, uh, and the establishment of uh, new uh, hedges. And you can see in the table uh, that we've reviewed 
uh, and where necessary elicited expert opinion on the likely efficacy of those best management uh, practices. And we use this type of information in our computations to try and understand uh, what the implementation of best management is delivering uh, in terms of uh, managing uh, fine sediment delivery and whether it can close the exceedance of um, those management targets based on modern background sediment delivery uh, to uh, rivers. So if we pull all of that together, the impacts of the structural land cover, the impacts of the current implementation of best management as driven by current policy levers, uh, then we can uh, estimate um, for every water body nationally the sediment loss reduction associated with um, business as usual in farming uh, here and today. And that's shown in uh, the uh, left hand map. And uh, in essence, you can see for large parts of the country, best management under business as usual uh, is actually having a very small impact in terms of reducing sediment loss. Um, in many areas, uh, less than a 6% reduction associated with the current uptake of best management. Uh, and you'll see uh, our best estimates of maximum impact uh, lie between about 12 uh, and 19%. Uh, percent. So a very subdued impact in terms of what current best practice uh, is actually delivering. And in turn, we can use that information uh, to correct our best estimates of current loss uh, from agriculture to reflect the current uptake of best management uh, in addition to the drivers associated with current cropping practices, uh, woodland cover, grass cover uh, and uh, stocking densities. And ultimately what that enabled us to do was to look at the ratio uh, of current agricultural loss taking into account best management practice uh, against the target modern background sediment delivery to rivers, the left hand map, uh, or the ratio against the maximum modern background sediment delivery to rivers, uh, the right hand map. And I guess uh, these are maps of non-compliance. So you can see that in some areas of the country, uh, there is uh, no exceedance. Um, but where we do uh, have exceedance, then in extreme cases, the current loss rates are over five times higher uh, than our best estimates of modern background sediment delivery to rivers, which predate uh, the post-World War II uh, intensification uh, of uh, agriculture. And of course, these types of maps give us new compliance maps for spatially targeting uh, improved management of uh, the fine sediment problem. Now, since we did that original strategic piece of work, um, we've continued to look at this exceedance of modern background uh, sediment loss to uh, rivers and our current piece of work has been focusing very much at our own research station which is at Northwick which is in the southwest of uh, England in the county of Devon uh, and we're very fortunate here to have the world's most instrumented uh, farm platform for uh, livestock and arable systems. So it covers a total of 66 hectares uh, and uh, comprises uh, 15 fully hydrologically uh, isolated catchments. And those are grouped into uh, three groups, each comprising five catchments. So we have a, a green uh, treatment or farmlet. Um, now, this is long term permanent pasture uh, under business as usual with uh, normal uh, grass fertilization. We have a blue treatment, uh, which has experienced scheduled plough and reseed of the grass uh, to gradually introduce 
uh, a grass clover mix with the intention of reducing artificial fertilizer inputs. Uh, and then we have a red treatment or farmlet shown in the middle map. Uh, this initially was um, ploughed and reseeded with a novel deep rooting grass, but has since been evolved into uh, an arable uh, treatment. And so we're now able to compare side by side uh, sediment loss in these hydrologically isolated field scale catchments for uh, both grassland uh, with no scheduled plough and reseed, grassland with scheduled plough and reseed, and also uh, arable uh, land use. So as I mentioned, um, this is uh, one of the most instrumented uh, livestock farms uh, in, in the world. And um, I was just shown an example of some runoff there during a storm event. So each of the fields are hydrologically isolated. Uh, we have at the outfalls of each of those fields, uh, a monitoring station where uh, we have uh, a flume. Uh, we also have multi-parameter SOMs uh, for measuring things, including turbidity, uh, so that we can estimate uh, sediment loss. Uh, um, we're also measuring a whole host of, of other determinants, including those for water quality, um, but also other aspects of the system, so soil quality, atmospheric emissions, and we gather a lot of information on farm management. And collectively, um, since 2010 or 11, when this farm platform was initiated, uh, 35 million data points have now been uh, collected. In the case of the turbidity data, I guess we're taking a standard approach. So routine uh, measurements every 15 uh, minutes. Uh, perhaps one slightly unusual aspect is that the turbidity sensors are in uh, flow bypass cells within the monitoring cabins because, of course, we're at field scale. And so uh, runoff uh, is uh, not continuous because of the uh, scale at which we are uh, working. So um, we've taken a standard approach where we have um, paired readings using the turbidity sensors with uh, gravimetrically filtered water samples collected using uh, automatic water uh, samplers uh, to develop suspended sediment concentration turbidity ratings. Uh, now, because, as I mentioned earlier, we're comparing permanent grass with no ploughing with a grass system that has scheduled plough and reseed uh, and an arable system, which obviously has plough and reseed uh, on an annual basis. We've been very careful to develop um, a sediment rating. Uh, which is more representative of periods of um, high vegetation cover uh, and also an alternative sediment rating, um, which is a more representative of, of conditions uh, immediately post plough, uh, till uh, and reseeding when the soil, of course, is uh, much more uh, exposed. So we haven't just used a single uh, sediment rating irrespective of the ground uh, cover conditions when we've estimated sediment loss from uh, these field scale uh, catchments. So, uh, as I say, we have a long running data set from about 2010 or 11 until uh, now uh, at 15 minute time intervals when the fields are experiencing flow. And so what we've able to do is to examine our measured uh, uh, sediment loss uh, in the context of those estimates of modern background sediment delivery to uh, rivers. And if we have a look at the uh, green treatment, so this is long-term permanent pasture, no plough and reseed. Uh, so this is grazed by uh, sheep and beef cattle. But best management is practice. So in the winter, the cows are, are housed uh, to avoid trampling and excess damage to uh, the soils. Um, the important point to note here is that we are 
in uh, three of the five catchments, we are seeing exceedance of uh, TMB, so the target modern background sediment delivery to rivers. And in fact, in, in one of the five catchments under long-term permanent pasture, uh, we are actually seeing some exceedance of the maximum modern background sediment delivery to rivers. So I guess here the important point is that where we have long-term permanent pasture, no scheduled plough and reseed, best practice in terms of grazing management, no outdoor wintering, so the cows go in uh, during uh, the seasonally waterlogged winter, when runoff and erosion uh, is happening, we are still seeing, <clears throat> in some cases, exe exceedance of our best estimates of modern background uh, sediment delivery uh, to uh, rivers. If we go to uh, the blue treatment, uh, so this is grassland, but which has a scheduled plough and reseed, uh, for the grass clover uh, mix, then we can see that the shock to the system associated with uh, the plough and reseed exposure of bare tilled soils means that actually more uh, of the catchments are uh, exceeding uh, both the target modern background and indeed the maximum modern background uh, sediment delivery to rivers. So very clear evidence of the risks associated with elevating sediment loss uh, associated with uh, those um, periods of scheduled plough and reseed. And in many of our grassland systems, uh, a scheduled plough and reseed every few years is, is a key component of the management system to ensure uh, that the quality of the grass sward does not decline uh, so much that it impacts uh, overly negatively on uh, the production uh, of your uh, livestock. Now, this particular journey at our own research farm, again, is uh, continuing. Uh, and some of the work that one of my postdocs did really started to examine uh, our measured sediment loss rates across these um, 15 experimental field scale hydrologically isolated catchments uh, in the context of um, potential controls and drivers. And the interesting thing here is that actually we found no correlation uh, in the loss rates that we measured with things like uh, proportion of the field catchments that were heavily poached or the area of those field catchments uh, that was heavily poached. What we did find was that the strongest correlation or relationship uh, was uh, with uh, catchment area. And um, with this particular piece of work, which was uh, published in uh, the Journal of Environmental Management last year, uh, we undertook some detailed uh, field observations during uh, rainstorms and runoff events. And we identified uh, raindrop impacted saturation, excess overland flow as a field wide dominant mechanism uh, driving the sediment loss from uh, our heavily instrumented uh, farm platform. We then decided to try and capture, well, what is the implication of that new mechanistic understanding uh, gathered on the Northwick farm platform? <coughs> Excuse me. And the way we framed this was that our interactions with current policy delivery programs, particularly those focused on the delivery of advice to farmers on best management, tell us that um, many of the recommendations are based on a very quick visual audit uh, of erosion problems on uh, livestock farms. And of course, not surprisingly, those uh, frequently one-off visual audits are very heavily drawn to the visual uh, evidence for uh, soil exposure and uh, erosion. And these tend to be particularly drawn to those poached areas. And so the types of recommendations that we see are shown uh, in the top left-hand 
table in this particular slide. So the recommendations based on visual farm audits would include things like moving feeder rings at regular intervals, constructing uh, concrete bases for your cattle drinking troughs, providing them with water, recite your gateways away from high risk areas, farm track management and uh, probably establishing riparian buffer strips. Uh, these are the types of measures which would be recommended uh, under business as usual. But actually, the monitoring and the mechanistic evidence from the heavily instrumented farm platform is shown that there's no correlation actually between uh, the sediment loss rates that we are measuring uh, and the areas of visually obvious uh, poaching damage. And instead, we have a, a field-wide sediment loss mechanism, that saturation excess uh, overland flow um, driven by raindrop impact. And so um, that means actually uh, that advice needs to be rec uh, recommending uh, interventions and measures which are likely to have a more field-wide impact. And the types of measures in our current policy packages thereby would be things like reduce the length for the grazing season, reduce field stocking rates when soils are wet, locate your outwintered stock away from water courses if you have to outwinter, loosen your compacted soil layers, uh, and use correctly inflated low ground pressure tyres again uh, to uh, ensure that you're trying to manage any compaction uh, problem. And our latest work basically has been showing that if we take the mechanistic uh, evidence and use that to frame uh, the management uh, practice as shown in the bottom right hand table here, then the impacts of best management can certainly be improved over and above the current recommendations, which are based on uh, visual uh, evidence because it, our uh, science is telling us that there's no correlation between the heavily poached areas and the measured soil loss rates. But I guess an overarching problem is that regardless of whether we're using a visually based set of recommendations for best practice or a mechanistically based set of recommendations uh, for best practice, in some instances, neither set of recommendations is able to close the exceedance of um, modern background sediment loss. And so ultimately, this means that if we're not prepared to accept some exceedance associated with the production uh, of food in these grass systems, uh, then uh, ultimately uh, we will be faced with the need for some structural uh, land cover uh, to try and provide uh, additional benefits from best management to try and improve compliance uh, with <coughs> uh, sediment management targets based on uh, modern background sediment delivery uh, to uh, rivers. And so I just wanted to finish by acknowledging um, a number of people. So some of these are postdocs in, in my research team. So Dr. Yusheng Zhang uh, and uh, Dr. Simon Pulley. Um, but I also wanted to acknowledge some external collaborators who um, continue to work with me in some instances, particularly Ian Foster. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, he was critical in helping uh, us establish these estimates of modern background sediment delivery to rivers because of his expertise nationally on paleolimnological evidence. And in fact, we will soon be starting a new program of work with Ian uh, to call some additional lakes with the aim of trying to improve our understanding of those modern background sediment loss rates to rivers. And I also wanted to acknowledge uh, in terms of collaboration in that first piece of national work, uh, David Sear from the University of Southampton, UK, uh, and Pamela Naden from the UK uh, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. Pam uh, retired a couple of years ago. Uh, and also Ewan Jones, a biologist from Queen Mary uh, University of uh, London. 
Okay, thank you very much. So, thank you very much, um, Professor Collins, uh, for excellent talk and uh, presentation. So, um, there we will now have some questions from, from the participants. Um, so there is uh, uh, first question is from Evgenia Kolesnikova. Uh, so the first question is from Evgenia Kolesnikova, PhD from Russian State Hydrometeorological University. Uh, so can a pond system solve the problem of sediment loss? The pond system. Um, so, um, ponds, of course, <clears throat> can be a very useful best management practice, but as with many um, structural mitigation measures, of course, you do need to manage sedimentation. Uh, so, of course, they can be extremely effective at trapping uh, sediment. Um, but what the landowner or the farmer needs to be clear on, of course, is that need for extracting the silt that is captured so that the efficacy of the trap is is not reduced and, uh, and you know, it doesn't fill up basically and stop working. So, yes, extremely effective. There's some very good uh, uh, experimental evidence in the UK on the efficacy uh, of ponds on the farm for trapping sediment. But as I say, the key issue is the farmer must uh, extract the trapped material to ensure that those features keep working. Could you also comment uh, additionally to that? Uh, what is the, let's say, percentage of the river system is uh, uh, split with the ponds or in general maybe some I just to understand is it a um, typical system in UK yeah so um, the uptake uh, of um, on-farm sediment traps in ponds you know is beginning to increase I mean if you actually look at sort of natural ponds and lakes we actually have you know a, a huge number uh, nationally we have a national database and if we take every pond uh, and every lake nationally I believe there's around 200,000 across England and Wales so many um, ancient uh, features uh, that have registered also increasing numbers of man-made features as well um, so they can play an important role in terms of trapping sediment but as I say um, if they're not managed where inputs are high, then obviously their efficacy will decline. Okay, 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 good. Thanks. So then there is uh, another topic, another question. Uh, so the, the from Leo Lumens from his Master of University of Twente. Uh, so how many years, in your opinion, it will take to reach target values in sediment delivery? Okay. Um, well, I guess the key message is that our current um, best practice management will not achieve uh, the management targets. Uh, so the, the harsh reality is that we probably need some structural land cover change in conjunction with the targeted measures. So um, we need more woodland being planted. We need some change in land cover. But of course, we still need to retain um, farm production because we need food. Uh, um, and uh, I guess, you know, the other issue is the softer measures, the buffer strips, the ponds, the tillage practices, etc. We need more careful targeting of those practices. But in essence, all of our work is showing if we don't have some structural land cover change, we will never meet those management targets everywhere. Okay, okay. <clears throat> um, then, uh, so the questions to the monitoring uh, a little. So there is other some um, installation uh, which you use or you also adopt uh, regarding the monitoring of bank erosion. Uh, so I, I think it's also the question that on the photo you showed it was looks like on the bank, eroded bank, there was some uh, 
looked like some stick, uh, like some... Ah, okay, no. Um, <clears throat> okay, sorry. So in, in the bank erosion photo, there is a trowel, uh, a small spade, basically. I put that in the photograph just for scale. So... Uh, it's not an erosion pin or anything like like that. It it was basically just put there to try and uh, give a, a you know um, a perspective on the scale or the size uh, of, of the bank. So you know um, a number of methods are used nationally. I mean you can have um, manual erosion pins or the photo you know electric erosion pins. The peeps you know some research groups have. Uh, use those. Uh, in terms of our work um, here, most of our evidence on the bank erosion is a combination of sediment source fingerprinting with sediment yield measurements or estimates, and then we convert um, the source fingerprinting proportions into masses loss uh, from uh, eroding channel banks. Mm -hmm. So, and from my side, the question. So, that was I was wondering about the skid lines for fishes that you showed, and so they, that's uh, I didn't get. So, you you said that it's uh, they're not uh, adapted in you in Horizon or in this Euro, I mean in Water Framework Directive, uh, but this is the UK standard which uh, you showed in this table, or it is what is and how it's adapted, and it's like. The single for the whole country, or it's some have some basin scales. So. Yeah, so um, that that's right. So the water framework directive um, it, it doesn't stipulate a sediment management target. So we adopted the freshwater fish directive target twenty five uh, ppm uh, as an annual mean, but that was applied for every river, which of course is crazy because in the UK, we have a very steep rainfall gradient. You know, we have an east-west gradient in rainfall, soil types, uh, topography, slopes. And so people just said, you know, that this is crazy to have a, the same target for all catchments, regardless of the you know, their different physiographic characteristics. And so that was really one of the reasons that we started on this journey of looking at regimes uh, uh, and trying to come up with these estimates of modern background. The reason we switched to looking at regimes is because if you look at experimental evidence for impacts of say sediment concentration on different biological species the uncertainty ranges even for the same species can be absolutely enormous and so because of that noisiness in the data you know the scope for selecting concentration based ecologically relevant targets is very challenging mm -hmm. So, and okay, and that's you, you. You think that 25 milligram per liter that is was uh, mentioned, it's something very, um, very tricky, let's say. Or what's yeah, I mean, I, I just don't think it's representative, you know, uh, uh, of the you know, the issue nationally. Our rivers are very different, the geology, the soils, the landscapes are very, very different to just use the same target when, you know, the intrinsic loss rates do vary, um, you know, just, just doesn't make sense. But as I say, the complexity of <clears throat> setting ecologically relevant targets is also a big problem. So a compromise is to look at regimes and to look at the lake evidence for the modern background uh, losses. So it simplifies the problem. Not everybody is happy with it, but I think it's a very workable solution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. That's a very arguing topic for us you now, but the scales of the country is crazy to adapt. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the point. Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Collins. So we have some also thanks from the participants who uh, commented and said like, thank you for a very interesting and informative lecture. Okay. Uh, and also from our side, from the organizing committee, thank you very much that you accepted the invitation. And so we hope that in future we'll have uh, special ties between you and your group 
with our university, which also have a long history already. Yes. Okay. Perfect. No. And thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciated it. I think you've put together a fantastic program of speakers. Uh, so congratulations on on that. It's always good to see uh, sediment and water quality issues given some exposure, given how important they are globally. So you know, well, well done, uh, and thank you again. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Okay. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> so and uh, so, dear participants, we are now uh, finishing the second round of our lecture course. Uh, we'll have now the break uh, until the uh, late afternoon in Moscow Moscow time. So this we will continue at uh, at, at, at at four, I guess, at five at five. Yes, we just. We changed a few times the schedule, so it's quite difficult now to um, remember everything. So we continue at five o'clock uh, p.m. Moscow time. So please uh, mind the differences in time uh, and uh, switch back to YouTube channel at five. And we will have three lectures in the evening session today uh, on gully erosion topic, on the glaciers impacts on water quality and on the global fluvial sediment modeling so that that's also very challenging issues uh, please uh, join the uh, translation later on and uh, see you and goodbye